And if you have a market where there's a lot of speculative buying going on in hopes to flip the properties really quickly, once the rug gets pulled out from under them, all those buyers go away and everybody loses everything. The whole thing crashes and burns, I think. You were just saying, hey, it's a really interesting market that we're in right now. That was your the language that you used. If I might ask you, what what were you what do you mean by that? You were saying I think something about inventory and Well, man, uh, let me dive into it, bro. So right now, every buyer is competing against eight other buyers, and no owner wants to list their property because there's nothing to buy. There's nothing to replace what they have. If they were to list it today, they're scared that they might leave money on the table since the market's moving upward so fast, okay, because of the lack of inventory. So we're in this really interesting market where it's really tough to represent a buyer that's competing against eight other buyers on the same property and trying to get listings in a market where nobody wants to list their property. Now, I'm not stereotyping the market that nothing's happening because if you look on MLS, there's tons and tons and tons of closings happening every single day. I'm just saying that the market is very tight and the effort per transaction right now is at an all time high effort per transaction, especially for newer agents who don't have their foundation established in the market and their personal brand matured, if you will. So that's what I mean about the interesting market. It really feels like 2003 all over again in terms of the amount of demand and how quickly listings sell. There's a couple of big differences. One is prices are already really high right now compared to where we started in 2003, whereas we were at the very bottom end of prices and we had a lot of room to grow and price wise i still think we have a lot of room to grow from the point that we are now but how high can it really go that's the question back then the reason why prices doubled in two years is because there was no regulation on lending right you could walk into a bank you didn't have to document your income you right. could put whatever you wanted on your application and then the banker's best friend appraiser goes out and appraises the property for whatever they wanted to appraise it for now there's all kinds of regulations on documenting your income and you have to go through third party vendors to set up the appraisals. The bankers can't even talk to the appraisers anymore. So there's a lot of regulations on the lending side that is really different than what it was in 2003. In 2003, it was easy to get listings because prices were going up so fast, faster than they are now. And it was easy to find somebody who wanted to make 100,000 today or make 150,000 or make 50,000. So it was right. easier. It was easier to get listings. And furthermore, the buyers right now, the buyers buying in today's market for the most part are all end users they're buying the house to live in for a long time they're investing in the house to, to buy and hold it and rent it out for a long time hardly anybody is buying to flip now that was more so true last year than it is this year now i'm starting to see a little bit of flipping going on in the market just a little bit not a lot as that speculatory buying increases Okay, that's where the bubble starts to build. And if you have a market where there's a lot of speculative buying going on in hopes to flip the properties really quickly, once the rug gets pulled out from under them, all those buyers go away and everybody loses everything and the whole thing crashes and burns. So I think I think if you if you ask my opinion on the state of the market, I think we're in a very healthy market, a very stable market with a great foundation of great fundamentals. I think that we are in the beginning stages of a possible bubble starting to build, but I think we're on the front end of it. I think that we're, I think that we're fixing to go on one of the largest real estate runs we've ever seen. I think it's going to be an incredible run and I'm along for the ride and I know how this story ends. Okay. I've been through, <laughs> I've, I've been through this a couple times. I know exactly how this story ends and um, it's really good to be in my position where you have actually experienced this same story play out time and time again, where I can actually sit back and I can play chess with this situation and put all my pawns in position to really capitalize all the way up and all the way down. So that's what I mean by interesting market. Okay. I just uh, I just want to re quickly re ask Ricky a question before we do that, if you don't mind, Robert. So in some ways, I totally agree with you, Ricky, but how long do you think this, this I'll call it a bull market, this, this run, how long do you think it would go? Like two, three, four years before the final outcome as you remarked. You never know, ma'am. You never really do know. Um, if it's anything like 2003, that one lasted two years. 
right? By 2005, the market was starting to come down and, and starting to lose some steam. So you, you never know. That is unpredicted that you nobody can tell you how long that's going to last. If I really had to put my finger on and you like <laughs> back me into a corner and said, how long, you know, tell me something, then I would say two years if I had to put a number on it. But it could be six months. It could be five years. You don't know. I have a question, Ricky, because as you've already pointed out, you're you're saying effectively new agents without systems in place are going to work hard. And you're already saying that the market itself is is forcing even veterans like yourself to work much harder on the deals that you're doing. So let's actually take that 10 reasons why realtors fail and instead of say, if you're a new realtor and you're looking at all this extra work, why do you think, what, what would be the warning signs for you inside? Like you're looking at that new realtor, what would you tell that new guy and saying, you know what, we're in a really weird market right now. And then you give them a couple of pieces of advice. What would that be? Well, here's the thing. Here's a couple of things to say about that, right? So number one, it's not hard for a guy like me. Here's why, because I understand what the Googles, Facebooks, Apples, Amazon, Zillows of the world are doing, right? They're all after one thing, data. It's a drug. They're addicted. They can't get enough, okay? They're lo they'll lose money every month, every quarter, every year because they'll take their revenue and put it towards buying more data. Like they don't they're not even trying to make money anymore. They just want more data. They're an addict. Right. And so what you have to do is you have to think of your real estate business the same way, at just a smaller scale. We need we need to learn from these large corporations that are crushing it because they own all the data and understand that our real estate agent businesses need to be the exact same way. We need to collect as much data as possible. The reason why it's not hard for me is because I spent 15 years as a data collector, a data collector first and a real estate agent second. Through my journey of trying to collect the most data in the market, I closed tons of deals. But at the end of the day, I created database that I live off of now that produces 100 deals a year through past clients referrals and referrals of referrals because I built my brand using the data that I collected over the years. So if you think of yourself as a data collector first and a real estate agent second and look at the big picture that after you collect enough data, you don't have to make calls anymore. You don't have to do Facebook ads. You don't have to do anything because you have all the data. You have the prize of the data and you have a way that you stay in touch and in front of everyone in that database. Okay, it's a base of data, then then you, you can literally live. So since I own all the data and the market is tightened up, sellers that want to sell in this market, the ones that actually do, who are they gonna call? They're gonna call me. And so I just have people calling me and what's happening with the listings? They. <laughs> They sell in one hour. Now, what's going to happen when the pendulum swings the other way? Prices come down, demand comes down, inventory goes up. What's going to happen? Now, the investor buyers that are laying dormant right now in my database will come out the woodworks and who are they going to call? Ricky, hey, I want to buy all these great deals that are on the market right now. So when you own the data of the market, you own the entire market. It doesn't matter what the market does. As long as these people know who you are and you've built a brand around being a hard worker, honest, dependable, professional, you've used it the right way and built your brand the right way, then it doesn't matter what the market does, you own the market, okay? So, so understand that the effort per transaction is at an all time high for people getting into the market. But another statistic, effort per new relationship created and data contact created is is the same as it's always been effort per transaction all time high effort per new relationship new friendship new contact same as it's always been so 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 the goal needs to be how many friends can we make in the market and collect their data that's what's going to that's what's going to create this scenario where you win and put you in a position where you crush the market regardless of what happens when you own the data your effort per transaction pretty much stays the same no matter what the market does but here right. here's the difference there's a lot of sales people out there that aren't collecting data and that's where I see a lot of people struggling is when you're in the sales business, you got to go out there and sell again. Then you got to go out there and sell again. Then after that, sell, sell again. If you're in the data collection, personal branding business, it looks the same in the first couple of years because you're out there hustling and bustling and talking to people. But after three to five years, you're, you're, the two businesses look completely different. The personal brander, you know, he's an autopilot, but the sales guy that's not collecting data, that's just trying to do deal after deal, he's still out there and he still has to hustle and bustle for every single deal. So. It depends on how you look at it.